بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ڈیئر ویورس ٹوڈے وی آر ویری فارچونیٹ ٹو ہیو ڈاکٹر منظر کف ہو نیڈس نو انٹروڈکشن ان دی ورلڈ آف اسلامک فنانس وہ از اے ٹاپ ناچ ایکسپرٹ ان اسلامک فنانس اینڈ آلسو اے لیڈنگ اسلامک اکنامسٹ از بیسڈ آؤٹ آف ویسٹ منسٹر کیلیفورنیا ان دی یو ایس اے ہی ہیز بین اے پروفیسر ایٹ ارمک یونیورسٹی جوردان اینڈ he does uh, independent consultation lecturing and training in islamic finance he has been the head of islamic research and training institute which is the research division of islamic development bank in jeddah he has won the prestigious uh, islamic development bank prize in islamic economics in the year 2001 and he has also received the presidential award for the best student passing out from a syrian university So let us welcome Dr. Mandir Kaf, alhamdulillah, to the Thank show. You. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may make a little correction, yeah. I headed the research division in the Islamic Research and Training Institute. institute. I did not head the institute itself. Okay. Right. So let's go to the uh, detailed discussion on Islamic finance. So sir, uh, what we would like to know from you on the very outset is, what does Islamic finance mean to a country like India? And also, how does people understand the difference between Islamic finance and conventional finance, or Islamic banking and conventional banking uh, from, a, from a very, very, you know, uh, layman's perspective? Well, as a matter of fact, for India, Islamic finance means a lot. It means for every Hindu in India, it means a lot for every Christian in India, and it means a lot for every Muslim in India. Because Islamic finance is not at all religion-based. It is rules-based. A set of rules, once this set of rules is placed in the banking system, the banking system will work in a better functional way. This is where, what it is. And here, if I start from the beginning, Islamic finance means making finance doing its proper job without uh, bringing nuances, bringing problems, bringing hesitations to the finance system. Now, how is that done? Simply by linking all finance transactions to real market transactions. Now, again, this means an important thing. It means that Islamic finance is no more than what every layman in India, in the Arabia, in America, in everywhere knows. Islamic finance means provision of goods on sale basis, provision of utilities and usufruct of uh, long-term assets on Ijara basis, provision of capital for new projects on Musharaka basis. So that is then Islamic finance uses sale on credit, uses leasing, as we all know it, uses sharing contract to make new product partnerships and the like, as we all know it. So this is as what is there in the commercial law in India. How is the commercial law in India defines sale on credit? It says you give the commodity now, the goods now, and you pay later either one payment in the future or on installment. And this is what is Islamic finance. It's exactly nothing beyond that. The Islamic institu finance institution 
will buy and sell in a financial sense, not in a commercial sense. This is very important. Let me say this thing, describing the transaction. A customer wants to buy a new car, or a company wants to buy a new machine, comes to the Islamic bank, after they select what they want to buy completely, and they negotiate the price. They come to the bank and tell it that here is the machine or the car. I know the price of it, and I got uh, a bill, I mean like pro forma bill, what they call. I, I got an initial offer from the seller he is going to sell it to me for this price. So please buy this car for this machine and I will buy it from you on installment at a higher price. So you make profit. Islamic finance is to make profit through finance. It is not charitable finance. That's a different institution. Zakah and Awqaf and other things, these are institutions for uh, charitable finance. But we are talking about profit-making finance. So the, the Islamic bank will buy the car or the machine on your request. It does not buy it to show it in a showroom and then find a customer for it. You already asked the bank and you promised the bank to give it to it. That's to, to, that it will buy it and you buy it from the bank. Now, with that, we are in fact within the laws of banking here in India. We are not in any violation of the laws of banking because the laws say that a bank is not permitted to practice trading of goods and services. And we don't practice trading because we only buy on your request. We do not buy on our own decision. We do not buy to make trading with the goods. So there is no trading in Islamic Bank. There is financing. Now, as I described it exactly, when the controller of federal banks in the United States was asked in writing about this transaction in 1999. The answer was, this is a regular banking transaction. It is not a transaction that violates the banking laws here in India or in the United States. What we do is regular banking transactions because the buy is not a commercial buy, it's a financial buy. And the sell is a financial sell, it is not a commercial sell. This difference is very important, and this is what makes and characterizes Islamic finance and Islamic financial institutions, Islamic banks. What merchants do is something different. They buy on their own decision and they expose their goods for customers to see them and buy from them. An Islamic bank does not do that. It, buy, it buys on request from the customer and sells to that customer who asks for financing. It is a financing buy and a financing Sell. sell. Therefore, it is not subject in America to the sales tax. Sorry. It is subject to the interest tax. It's like interest. It, you, it, it's like interest, but it is better than interest because when you give a loan on interest, that loan may be used for any objective. Not all the time it is used only to buy goods. When you make Islamic finance, since you don't give cash, you don't give loans, every single Islamic finance transaction 
will always be connected to the real market. There will be no excessive finance. The crisis of 2008 was caused by excessive finance. You cannot make excessive finance if you apply Islamic banking. Yes, sir. And uh, <clears throat> building upon what uh, you have explained to us, the global Islamic finance industry is uh, fast approaching the dollar three trillion mark now. But uh, the irony is that India is the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia, and it is fast approaching uh, Indonesia in the number. But nothing serious has happened in Islamic finance front in India. And uh, this has been mainly because of the legal framework in which we are living, or because uh, as far as Islamic banking is concerned, the banking act is a hindrance. But what I understand is that there are many other areas in Islamic finance which the Islamic finance entrepreneurs, if they wanted, could have leveraged, but that has not happened. So how do you look at this uh, scenario from a global perspective? I mean, if you have that the laws in India do not st stand as hindrance, I don't believe that. Okay. I think it's not the law, rather, it is the individual understanding of the law. Because the law says banks should not practice trading of goods and services. And Islamic banks do not practice trading of goods and services. So exactly the same. So we are fully in conformity with the law in India. When we buy, this is a financial buy. And when we sell, this is a financial sell. Because we do not buy without a customer coming and asking for finance. We do not buy. Right. So we are not trading goods and services. It is the understanding, honestly speaking, and I'm sorry to have said it this way, it is the understanding of some individuals in the high ranks of the Federal Reserve of India, including the gentleman who was in the conference in 2006, and he was Muslim also, from the Federal Reserve of India, who said that the law does not allow Islam banks to buy, and in Islamic banks we buy and sell. We told him, I told him then, in that conference in Delhi in 2006, I told him, you are, your understanding is incorrect. That is not what Islamic banks do. They buy a financial buy and sell a financial sell because they do not buy before a customer comes and asks for financing to buy a given goods. So without that, they don't buy, then it's incorrect really to claim that the law do not allow. It's the understanding of some people. Right. And I am willing and I accept and I pledge, let's, let's establish an Islamic bank and I pledge on its behalf that we will never buy and expose, put in a showroom any goods, never. We will only Finance buy and finance sell. sell. Right. So we buy to finance based on a request, a request of finance, not a request of buy and sell. Okay. So I tell the Federal Reserve, I mean now and everywhere, I told the same in 2006 in that conference, we do not give buy and sell goods. That's not the job of Islamic banks. And Islamic banks can live in conformity with all the laws and regulations of the Federal Reserves of India. Okay. This is one. Two, are there other institutions? Yes, definitely there are other institutions. And honestly speaking, I believe that Islam is not only, I mean, Islamic finance is not for Muslims alone. So I really appreciate and I'm glad to hear 
that Muslims in India are the second largest uh, Muslim group in the world, but that does not affect really. We should establish Muslims, Hindu, Christian, Jews, Buddhist, whoever we are, we should establish Islamic banks because Islamic banks and Islamic financial institutions are better for the economy. Now, can we create other institutions? Yes, there are Islamic finance companies. We can create Islamic finance companies. companies right. And Islamic finance companies are permitted under the laws of India to take deposits from investors right. within certain limits. Of course, there are conditions and limits, and that is the, the, the life, the way life is everywhere in the world, because everywhere in the world we live under laws. So we need Islamic finance companies to provide finance and to be able to accept investment from uh, investors on the basis of uh, partnership, sleeping partnership. Those investors will be called sleeping or dormant partners. And uh, there are laws sometimes put at a given number. You cannot have more than 100 uh, sleeping investors in a uh, Islamic, in a finance company. We abide, we go by that. So we need finance companies that are based on Islamic finance. We need, especially for housing, and, and this is easy to be so done. So in a venture capital contest, yes. this could be we limited need, partners. We need also uh, cooperative companies or cooperative uh, organizations uh, to provide finance for the, the mass. We need also microfinance, which can easily be done in India under the existing laws. There is no need. I always claim that there is no need for any change in the laws. Right. What we need is understanding of the law, not the, the law itself. We need microfinance, and microfinance can always be supported by the, uh, the zakah, to lower the cost. The issue in microfinance, the main issue is that the poor needs one immediate help. He also needs investment to stand on his own. And he also needs education to know how to manage his finance. The poor usually lacks this. Right. lacks the immediate needs and, and lacks also the education to manage his own finance. And of course, we need to give him some resources to make him stand up. Now, zakah can help in that, along with microfinance institution. In this way, the microfinance will, be, will not cost the poor more than what is done in, uh, in, I mean, in, in, in for the rich in, right. in the market, in the business market. It will be about the same prevailing rate of interest in the country. Uh, we have an example which is important, in fact, and it's nearby here, under your nose, in Bangladesh. Right. We have Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank is based on donations from NGOs and other international institutions and from the government of Bangladesh, but it charges interest rate up to 54% sometimes to the poor, which is at least three times the interest rate the rich pays to the banks in Bangladesh. Okay, now compare this with the Islamic finance offered by the Bangladesh Islamic Bank. The Bangladesh Islamic Bank depends in its Islamic finance project on two channels in addition to the funds that need to be given and returned. 
they depend on zaka resources and they depend on awqaf the the bangladesh islamic bank created a foundation which is awqaf and the islamic world for the foundation is awqaf created a foundation whereby the revenue of the properties of this foundation can be used to support microfinance, provide salaries, provide expenses, and so on. So with zakah, you help the poor directly with immediate needs. You can also help the poor with uh, capital assets, small capital assets. And with the help of the awqaf, you can educate the poor. And in that way, you do not charge the poor the cost of this education. Grameen Bank charges the poor the cost of this uh, education. Because, I mean, he, he, educators have to be qualified. Yeah. And uh, usually, educators are from the middle class, not from the poor. Because they are educated, they, they have university degrees, very often they have masters, not only uh, university degrees, higher degrees. So you need good people with good qualification to help the poor raise their level of ability to manage their own finance. With that, the, uh, the, the Islamic Bank of Bangladesh does not charge the poor for this cost, okay. whereas Grameen Bank charges, charges the poor. Right. This is why the rate of interest is high in Grameen Bank, but the rate of uh, uh, markup uh, in, in the Islamic Bank, in the Islamic Bank project of microfinance uh, is low, is normal. <coughs> the same rate that is charged in the bank itself. Yeah. It's not a higher rate. Okay. So basically what you're saying is that what we need is out of the box thinking and some aggressive entrepreneurship rather than uh, you know saying that uh, the law is the hindrance because if we don't have any critical mass in the market nobody is going to bother is that the case that that is exactly correct we need you see why it is called islamic finance because it happened that we muslims started it yeah but it's not really islamic in its rules it's normal like anybody uh, that can do it. So we need good entrepreneurs from among ourselves because it is ours now. It is Islamic finance. I mean, every, the, every part of the world knows it as Islamic finance. So definitely we need here in India to take the lead in um, having aggressive entrepreneurs creating Islamic investment companies and then invite investors with us and creating housing cooperatives. I have a good example in, in Toronto of the Islamic housing cooperative, which grew and became one of the very big corporations. And it provides housing uh, to, to many Muslims in Canada and also to non-Muslims. And you don't need to restrict it to Muslims, really, it will be to everybody. So we need housing cooperatives housing finance cooperatives and we need other cooperatives to finance other right. uh, things like car and customers and uh, other uh, needs in addition to the microfinance we need microfinance institutions that can help the poor right okay so uh, talking more about the indian economy indian economy is an agrarian economy with uh, 70 percentage of its population directly or indirectly employed in the agricultural sector and 14% uh, of the GDP is contributed by agriculture. But what's happening in India is over the last few years the contribution of agriculture to GDP is falling and farmer suicides are increasing. On an average 15,000 people commit suicide every year in different states of India because of the debt burden placed on by the banks on them they are not able to repay maybe it's because of the bad monsoon bad crop and they lose the land which is uh, made as a collateral to the bank etc etc and it's a catastrophic situation so this is a big burning issue in india these days so what islamic finance has got to offer to the most dominant sector of india and how it can revive the agricultural sector because it's uh, what's happening is fairly inhumane uh, in, in the very uh, face. Okay. 
Well, uh, you see, the nature of Islamic finance is development because it always relates every finance to the real market transaction. No. It puts a cap also on the finance, which is natural cap that you cannot finance more than the, the price of the goods that Correct. you are financing. Okay. So this is one. Now, for farming, the, the seasonal finance yes. uh, can be offered by Islamic finance on local basis. Okay. We need some localization instead of major banks or major institutions come into the, uh, in helping the, the, the small farmers. Those who are committed committing suicide are not big farmers. Definitely. Yes, definitely. They are small farmers and they are under debt. So to, to work in that environment, you need localized Islamic finance institutions based on cooperation. Right. Basically, the cooperative, I don't know how strong the cooperative movement in India, but we need really cooperative agricultural finance uh, organizations. Right. With this, Islamic finance has a lot to uh, to offer because of the uh, the nature of Islamic finance in being mo more moral. Right. Honestly speaking, we do have examples where uh, Grameen Bank collectors were going and destroying the house of, of the debtor, but that never happened in the, uh, Bangladesh. the other example in right. the Bangladesh microfinance right. project. Never happened. Okay. The reason is when uh, the uh, Islamic finance, because of its moral commitment yeah. and because of implementation on the local level, then the local people will take care of that all the time. Okay. And the local people will be all the time able to help the one who is in trouble and then uh, explain the issue in a good way to the central or to the larger organization. And since you have multiplicity of resources, not only the uh, resource that aims at giving finance and make a return on it, you have also the, the fund that is free, distribute zakah. You have the awqaf that uh, whose return will be also used for that. So we, with this combination, we can make a lot in the uh, Indian sector, in agriculture, with small farmers. I think what we need in this regard, we need a pioneer project. All right. And I really, honestly speaking, I understand you told me that the Jamaati Islami is uh, having some media and some project. Yes. Jamaati Islami should start local projects, the, the, I mean, there is central to just help the localities. Right. But I don't want central organization. We need it to be local. Decent, uh, decentralized model. Decentralized completely. The center's job will be only to give support right. when needed. But we can do a lot by these local small cooperatives among farmers. Right. And that, I think, what we should do and tomorrow morning, please, you, uh, you, uh, you, are you from Jamaati Islam? Yes, of course. Okay, so please do that tomorrow morning. Okay. We need tomorrow morning to have some organizations in our localities. Inshallah. Everywhere. Inshallah. Inshallah. And uh, if we have all these kind of an organization set up, what specific tools in Islamic finance we would be using, like Salam, uh, Muzara, Musaqat? Uh, how would the, that work? The, the, I think the most important thing that we can use, definitely Muzara'a can be a way, but uh, we, we need not only a tool that uh, allows us to make profit, we need also with it to incorporate the concept of zakat. zakat. Give you an example in, uh, in, in Sudan. The Zakah Fund in Sudan wanted to finance the small farmers who were in, in difficulty. So they made a project. The total cost of the project was really trivial. 
was about $300,000. And they helped with it more than uh, six, 7,000 families. The way they help them is to sell them uh, the, uh, the, the seeds Produce. and fertilizers, some of the inputs. Yeah. So they sold the input to them and without uh, forcing them to specific date of payment. Okay. They said the payment, we get it when you got the harvest. Okay, and sell it in the market. Right. And the payment was on the basis of loan. This is the car fund. Okay. So they gave loan without any increment. Right. But look at the result. The result was that most of these farmers, at the end of the season, were able to pay zakat themselves. Out of their product, the total zakat collected came to be about 80% of the amount of loans. The zakat only. Right. Now, loans were returned 100%, 100%. And usually, when you deal with small uh, farmers, especially in the, uh, on community uh, on, on community basis, local community basis, the uh, the payback is very high. very high. Everywhere in the world, not right. only among Muslims, yes. in, in South America, the payback is is above ninety eight percent. So the payback is very high when you deal on community, local community base, because everybody knows everybody, mm -hmm. and this is what they did. And that works on the basis of kafalat, mutual guarantees. Yeah, it's like mutual, without being formal mutual guarantee. You don't need a peer pressure formal. sort of a thing. It's the peer pressure, the living together that uh, you you wouldn't like to sense of community. Be, you know, uniquely that you you don't pay, but the others are paying. But the the most important factor or result here rather uh, was that they were able to pay zakat, they become rich in other words. Okay. Yani, uh, about 80% of them were able to pay zakat. So they on, not only paid the loans, they paid also zakat to the institution. And so the institution itself became more able to give in the future more. These kind of small projects, and especially when you use the Zakah Fund uh, and the Awqaf to support mm. the funds of, uh, f that are given f with the return, condition of return, that's, there is an income in it, uh, a profit for the uh, institution. So that makes a big difference with this support because it's more of a community work okay. rather than right. uh, simply a finance work. Okay, right, great. And also, sir, about the micro, small, and medium enterprises sector in India. It uh, accounts for 70% of all the employment generated in the industrial sector, contributes to 50% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. And yet, in all surveys, it is pointed out that the single most hindrance for the growth of SMEs is the availability, non-availability of bank credit on time. Right. So if we bring in Islamic finance into this context, it can be having a massive effect on the Indian economy, right? Yeah, but that is provided we localize the, the banking service. So decentralization is very, very yes. important. When we localize the bank, and, and in this, uh, Islamic finance cooperatives can help probably more than banks even. Okay. And this can be done under the existing laws quickly. Right. And under, even under the existing mentality of the Federal Reserve of India. So they can be done easily and quickly under the ex existing situation. Right. And so what about the infrastructure development? Because India is requiring around $500 billion every year to keep up with the infrastructure requirements. So specifically about Suku and all, which are used in a large scale. Let me give you this example. Right. Recently, uh, the new president after election of in, in Nigeria, Mr. Buhari, uh, wanted to tap on the local resources. Said we don't want anything from outside. We know that there are many people who have liquidity, right. but they are hiding it. Mm -hmm. So he offered 
100 billion naira. The naira there is maybe the, the rupiah here is about five naira because uh, for the dollar, the naira is about 300 naira for the dollar. dollar. Right. You have about 60 for the dollar. 67. Right? 67, so probably a little less than five. Uh, naira will equal rupiah. So when you talk about uh, uh, 100 billion, you are talking about a good amount. That is for the roads. And you know what happened? About three weeks ago only, the, uh, uh, these Sukuk were launched, okay. all the amount was covered. All right. All of it was covered. Sukuk to build roads, build and repair roads, and all of it was covered. So I am definite, and India has also a lot of liquidity. Right. There, there's no doubt about that. But people hide their liquidity. If they find a good project, that they, find, they see its results. And if they find that it is done without corruption, definitely they will come out and uh, take it out. I think if you want to sit and cry and wait for the Gulf money to come, it's not going to come, period. It's not going to come. Uh, the Gulf money goes to America and uh, Europe and uh, Canada and Australia. It's not going to come here. Okay, so what, what is needed is really an idea that tap on the abilities of our masses. Huh. The masses in India here can definitely help in that. And the idea of Suku is, is a lot more developmental than the idea of bonds. Right. What is the basic difference? You cannot issue Suku for a debt for the budget. Never. Okay. You can only issue school to build a project. Right. To make new roads, to make new dams, to make new uh, bridges, and so on. So you, that is to make developmental things. And it's not difficult at all. I'm sure, I'm definite, if India, Indian government, and also state governments, decide to issue school for the infrastructures, everybody will support them. Right. And I'm definite they will be they will gain support. Within a week almost, all the sukuk that were issued in Nigeria were covered. Okay? Right. So what happened in India was that many big corporates like Reliance Industries, which uh, you know, global conglomerate. They actually came up with uh, Sharia friendly, Sharia tolerant products. Like they launched a particular insurance plan, ULIP, in the market, Iman. And Taurus, other asset management companies also came up with Sharia compliant mutual funds. And there was an index on the stock market, which was a Sharia based index. Mm -hmm. But all these products did not take off in the Indian market. This is another irony that we are talking about because whatever is available in the market, there is a deep-rooted uh, uh, thinking in the minds of people that stock markets are not actually Sharia compliant. It's more towards gambling speculation. So can you uh, elucidate the difference between pure gambling, which is not allowed in Islam, and uh, the Sharia compliant market activities? I'm not much in, uh, in happiness with stock markets. Okay. As a matter of fact, yes, most stock markets uh, or most transactions in stock markets are gambling-like. Right. Uh, Maurice Allais uh, used to uh, propose, I think he probably is still alive, we checked, uh, just a few years ago, in 2013, that he was alive. So probably he's more than 100 years old now. Uh, Maurice Halle is the winner, the only French economist okay. who gained Nobel Prize. Oh. Okay, the only French economist. And he used to say all the time that we really don't need the uh, stock market to, up, to open 24-7. Now around the, glo the globe, you have 24-7 yeah. in the uh, trading of shares and bonds. 
you need it to open only for two weeks, two, two hours a week. All right. We don't need more than two hours a week because all these transactions, they are really not beneficial to the economy. Hmm. We need some liquidity in the economy so that if you find a better opportunity, you sell your shares and uh, go into an IPOs or into that is new company established or being expanded or go into another business. But uh, simply to, to be a negative investor, sitting, dorming at home and someone runs your fund in a mutual fund in the stock market, that's not a good business anyway and that doesn't add much to the economy. I believe in the direct action, All right. not in the real economic market. activity. Yes, really economic development action. That is through these uh, cooperatives of farmers, cooperatives of uh, small businesses in, in each locality, and then seeking financing and getting finance, and they will get from their own resources and from their surrounding. I believe in that, because that creates development. Yeah. That improves the life of everyone. Stock market does not improve the life of everyone. Right. And it does not. As a matter of fact, it does not. So I, I, I don't, I'm not much really enthusiastic about this stock about market, it, yeah. nor about the Islamic index. Mm -hmm. And I know this Islamic index in Mumbai, but um, I'm not really uh, enthusiastic about it at all. Um, most Islamic indexes really and you have some defects even in them. But anyway, that's a different issue. I think we need the direct action. Right. Uh, you see, we passed, before the mass media and the social media, we were living on, on the elite. Now we, we need to live on the, among the masses themselves, not on the elitid, elitist concept. Uh, these mutual funds, all of them are elitist concept. Yeah. Concept of uh, finance managers. I don't want that. I, I think what we need is direct action with the poor in the right. Sir, uh, regarding the development of Islamic finance, we must be having different case studies. You discussed about Bangladesh. Uh, there must be case studies in GCC countries, European countries, USA, Canada. So. Is it possible for us to trace a path for the Indian market, like this is how we should be proceeding, this should come first, like that should follow this? Will you be able to tell I, us? I, I tell you one thing, I, I don't want to reduce the important, because it looks from what I said that oh, there's no importance of investment in stock market and so on. No, there, there are attempts and these attempts are good. Right. But they are not the attempts that will bring the solution to the grassroots. Right. So to bring solution to the grassroots, I think we need to look at experiences that relate more to the grassroots. No. Uh, for instance, the experience of the Jordan Islamic Bank. The Jordan Islamic Bank, by its nature and by the structure of the economy in Jordan, uh, it's not an elitist economy. Okay. It's not an economy that uh, there is a big gap. There are few rich, very few, very rich, but these are really not part of the economy, not part of the society. They live all overseas and their wealth is all outside Jordan. Outside, yeah. So, but they are Jordanian and they, they come at the time of election or at the time of changing the government. They, they become ministers and so on. But that the, the bank, Jordan Islamic Bank, worked with the middle class and lower middle class. The SMEs or the part of M of the SMEs, yeah. the medium yeah. uh, enterprises. So they, they worked with them and they did a lot of good job. For instance, working with the taxi drivers. Within three, four years, the taxi drivers they worked with became owners of their taxis because you, they worked with them on partnership basis. That uh, we, we buy that taxi on your behalf 
and we give it to you and each day whatever you collect you deposit there is an amount that is assigned you can withdraw from that for your own living but then you deposit the remaining in the bank in the local branches of the bank and uh, at the end of each month we calculate how much you deposited you become owner of the car for that much in other words you are buying it from your own saving so within a few years, three to four years, you become owner of the car. And that experiment helped many taxi drivers that they become owners. They definitely became better off later on. So we need these kind of experiments to, to do on the local level. And it can, they can be done. Yani all we need is some collection of small funds locally, uh -huh. local funds. Uh -huh. And once we do that, I think we give examples then to other localities. I, I really believe in that, okay. in the grassroots work. Right. Thank you. One minute. So we will be trying to go.